Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a special extended conversation uh, between myself, Randall Carson, and Scott on Stott. Now, um, would we? Would anybody like to just kick off? I guess from where we left off on the show. Well, uh, Randall, you were talking about um, how comets periodically hit the Earth, and we were discussing plan, basically plan A and plan B. Yeah. Plan A would be to um, develop some kind of protective shield. I don't know if it's missiles or lasers or something to deflect the comets before they hit the Earth. Mm-hmm. And Plan B would be to develop some type of um, permanent monument on the Earth that encodes all of our knowledge or the most important knowledge in order to re uh, recreate a modern society, presumably with electricity and and machines and computers and so on, so that if there was a major disaster, we wouldn't have to start at the Stone Age again. Right. Well, that's is it, that's kind of the, the the story behind the Masonic allegory of um, of uh, Enoch and you know foreseeing that the great flood was going to come and wipe out the earth, and so he constructs an underground time capsule, an underground chamber consisting of of nine concentric uh, chambers, and in the, the central one, he encodes all of the information into a, um, a geometric solid, and then uh, covers it over, and then places up two pillars, one of marble and one of brass, uh, marble to withstand flood, and or no, marble to withstand fire, and brass to withstand flood, and then inscribes on those pillars you know, essentially the instructions that there exists this time capsule with this encoded information in it. Um, so, I mean, that, that's an intricate uh, part of the Masonic allegory, you know, this, the story of Enoch and, uh, and the nine-chambered time capsule that he builds. And then there's another mm-hmm. version where, where uh, it's Lamech who builds, who builds the, the chamber. But it's essentially the same thing, that these were individuals who foresaw the impending catastrophe and then took measures exactly as you're talking about to preserve as much as possible. And, you know, like you said, the Great Pyramid, that's an interesting because, you know, there's our legends that you can go to. These have been uh, recorded quite a bit by um, some of the earlier authors on the, on the pyramid, mostly from, from Islamic legends uh, from about the Middle Ages. But, um, you know, they may actually proceed the accounts we have from people like Herodotus and others, but they describe having traveled through Egypt and seeing the Great Pyramid before the casing stones were stripped off, which I think was, what, 11th or 12th century, right in there after the one of the, uh, there was an earthquake that flattened most of Cairo, and at the same right. time, it, it, yeah, and it, it, it apparently dislodged a couple of stones of the casing stones that no one had ever been able to successfully penetrate because of the incredibly tight joinery. But this earthquake apparently dislodged a couple of the stones, which then allowed them to get in with their, with their prize and their levers and, and essentially strip the entire, most virtually all of the casing stones. In fact, the ones that are still there apparently were preserved because they were buried under the rubble of stripping off the rest of the casing stones. But the Islamic that we don't we don't have uh, you know it happened so long ago and we don't have better accounts of what the pyramid was like before that because I've heard stories that the the uh, casing stones were actually covered in hieroglyphs. Yes, that's and exactly what I was about to. That yes, that's what I where I was going with this. That there are these stories and legends that the entire outside of the pyramid was covered with with inscriptions and hieroglyphs and symbolism, and I'm. Hey, my God, what what was lost with that? I mean, if there's truth to it, then why not? I mean, if you've been to Egypt, you go through, you know, you go down the Nile and you look at these temples, and it's mind-boggling the amount of information that is encoded into the into every column, in every lintel, in every wall space, on the ceilings, every square inch of these temples is covered in hieroglyphics and and symbolism. Why not the surface of the pyramid as well? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and it's too bad we missed out on all of that wisdom, and we're just sort of you know, trying to piece it together. But it, it's amazing that they encoded so much uh, you know, in the geometry, in the slope angle, in the 
in the sockets. You know, it encodes the speed of light. It encodes the uh, the the distance of uh, one degree of latitude. It, you know, it encodes the size of the Earth and the polar radius. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a treasure house of knowledge, um, but it's just hard to read. It, it it only like a it's not basically for the common person just to come in there and understand it all. It takes like a life lifetimes of study to unpack these these this information that, that's encoded in there. Yeah, just the fact alone of, of how it encodes geodetic information I found very compelling because, uh, you know, in some of my presentations, I, I take people through a whole lesson in geodesy and starting with the, um, you know, the measure of the Earth back in Napoleonic times right down through um, satellite surveys of the Earth and, um, you know, in the development of the world grid system. Um, and then <clears throat> after doing that, then we begin to look at the geometry of the pyramid. And it's, as you, I'm sure, I think we even talked about this, Scott, that it, that it is a perfect scale model of the Northern Hemisphere uh, on a scale of 43,200 to 1. That, um, yeah, and if you, um, again, graphically it's easier to see this, but, you know, the, there, there was a set of um, socket stones yeah, so surrounding hour. the Great Pyramid. Uh, that are no longer there, but the the, the impressions of the co uh, socket stones are still there. So one can actually measure two different ways. There's two different ways of determining the, the measure of the pyramid's base. And one corresponds to a, uh, a degree of equatorial latitude, and the other just uh, corresponds to a degree of equatorial longitude. And at, at a scale of 43,200, which, of course, is one of the, the sacred numbers of the ancient canon of cosmological numbers, um, you know, the basis of the, the Vedic system of the Yugas, it's found in the Sumerian king lists. Um, it's also the number, you know, at, a, at the moment of equinox, <clears throat> because there are <clears throat> 86,400 seconds in a day, at the moment of equinox, there would then be 43,200 seconds of light. 43,200 seconds of darkness. And that 43,200 is the scaling ratio. In other words, if you enlarge the Great Pyramid 43,200 times, its height corresponds to the polar radius, and its square base would then be the same as the Earth's, uh, the circle of the Earth's equator. Because, as you well know, Scott, the Great Pyramid's geometry squares the circle. That's right. Yeah, we need to encode this knowledge again, you know, in a, in other ways. I think um, just to um, back do our backup plan for a global catastrophe, it would be yes. good to ha have a number of, of pyramids around the world that uh, encode this sort of knowledge, and and maybe in in the core of them we could have, uh, uh, DVD you know, in the, uh, I don't know what the best the way to do it would be DVDs or. Books or, or you know, some way to record information that the, uh, presumably would last for thousands of years. Because you never know how long it's going to take people to find this thing and and gain access to the interior and decode it all. Um, I think you'd want to provide them with the quickest route possible to rediscovering all of these things. Because common, you know, the average person today doesn't know how. A computer works, or is made, or um, or a car. Um, you know how how you, how do you get the metal out of the ground to make a car? Right. You know, it's it's a, a long chain of things that needs to be explained. And right. there's um, actually a really <clears throat> inspiring thing called um, OpenSourceEcology.org. I've had the, I've uh, had those guys on the show before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and he has like 50 machines that are open source blueprints basically for recreating modernism um, hmm. and I think this is the right kind of uh, information that you need on a practical level but I would like to see some of this so-called Masonic information or uh, information about the harmony of the of man with the cosmos and with the micro scale as well uh, encoded in these monuments so that um, we have a sense of um, of uh, how everything is interconnected, how we were talking earlier about the fractal nature of the universe, how um, 
you know, we have the same scale invariant things that happen um, at, at vastly different different sizes. Um, so there'd be some way to encode that so that people could could understand that um, the, the whole universe is, is works with harmony, uh, you know, resonance and harmony are sort of fundamental principles. Uh, but, you know, most people don't understand that today. So um, talking about putting in the backup capsule is maybe a little premature because, um, you know, we, we need to get the word out to people in general how these things work uh, before they'd be willing to have that be the most representative information of the civilization yeah. to go down in the time capsule. Well, the impression I get, though, is that the cosmos is doing everything it can to try to get our attention, um, to make us aware of the fact that, yeah, yes, folks, there is a much bigger world and we are a part of it. Um, you know, I, I, I put out a limb here, and I don't usually like to make predictions, but I think it's likely that in the near future we will see more events like the one that occurred over Russia on February 15th. Um, because if some of the, the evidence, which we we'll probably don't have time to go into the, to the growing body of evidence that suggests that, again, there's a cyclic nature to the, to the delivery of this material into Earth's crossing orbits. And given the amount of cosmic activity of the last few months, uh, you know, just last week there was a large detonation over Argentina. I don't know if you remember hearing about that, but, um, you know, basically people were saying it lit up the night as bright as the day, you know. Um, and, of course, it didn't cause any surface damage, but it wouldn't take, um, you know, had that object that came in over Russia uh, been slightly bigger, had come in at a slightly steeper angle, or had been slightly denser, it could have penetrated considerably further into the atmosphere. And instead of, you know, a, a, a thousand injuries, there could have been a thousand or more fatalities. Um, and then, of course, if that, if that happened, then the world would sit up and take notice and go, wait a second, this, this is real. This isn't something that just, you know, the fantasy of some science fiction author, you know, this is real. Um, and then with that realization comes the growing evidence of how frequently this planet has been affected by uh, these kinds of events in the past would hopefully act as a stimulus for people to say, okay, come on, it's time for us to realize that uh, we're all on this ship together, and, you know, if we don't pull together, you know, we could all sink together. Um, and that, I think, Randall, is a very important of these, there, there are these caves in Turkey or Cappadocia, I believe, where they have uh, room for something like 20,000 people underground. Yes. They yes. are ancient caves. And yes. I just wonder if those people didn't uh, dig those because of, let's say, comets, um, a whole years of comets hitting the earth or something where it seemed like they, it, they were going to die, so they, they wanted to go under there for protection. Does that well, seem think, likely? Yes. Well, Scott, think about how many legends there are about uh, emergent stories. You know, the Hopi Indians here in, in, um, in the Navajo both have stories, for example, about uh, taking refuge underground um, during one of the cyclic catastrophes that decimated their ancestors. And then you know, after the recovery, coming back out to the to the surface world, um, and they described the people who had created these underground uh, refugium, if you will, as the ant people, the people that lived underground. And so right. there are, I'm sure, numerous such tales from around the planet of people taking refuge underground. Well, even in course, the, the movie Doctor Strangelove, they uh, they. Uh, talked about going into underground bases for hundreds of years and coming out later. And, um, you know, there's all this speculation about underground bases, like at the Denver in, uh, airport and in other many other locations. And one wonders if the military-industrial complex hasn't created a number of underground bases with uh, facilities for quite a large number of people um, in the case of such a, you know, a situation where uh, comets are raining down on us. Well, I think they have. I think it was motivated primarily by fear of nuclear war um, to create, you know, underground sanctuaries um, where people could survive. But clearly, you know, the, the same thing would occur 
in the case of comets. Now, obviously, if a if an impact was direct a direct hit or in the vicinity, being underground isn't going to make much difference. But one of the consequences of an impact of celestial objects would be devastating firestorms uh, that could literally encompass an entire continent. You know, uh, certainly like multiple states at a time. Under those circumstances, perhaps survival in some type of an underground sanctuary would be feasible. Um, but, but it just underlines how much better Plan A is than Plan B. Plan A is a much better plan. And, you know, here, here there's some irony built into this because, you know, there are companies now like Bechtel right now, um, the big military industrial contractor, um, is actually looking at the feasibility of, uh, joint venturing with some other companies to begin asteroid mining. And, you know, what's, here's, here's something that's interesting. Now, now Vinny, I mean, you probably have, you know, uh, the impression that humankind, and, and, and rightfully so, that we're doing a lot of damage to the environment by our extraction of resources. But there's probably not a single resource that we now extract from the Earth that isn't available in asteroids. And the thing is, the interesting thing is here is the most dangerous asteroids are the ones that obviously are on Earth-crossing orbits that come the closest to Earth, and those are the most accessible. And we are, you know, on the verge of having the technological capabilities of, of literally being able to harvest asteroids. And so I, I could see that 50 years or a century from now, we, we have evolved to essentially become a, a spacefaring civilization that can essentially now extract resources from the asteroids that we are now extracting from the Earth, thereby relieving the Earth of this burden, and at the same time, essentially mining those asteroids that would threaten Earth out of existence. And something Before tells me, to, something to, tells to, me that there isn't really a limit on how many asteroids there are in the universe to harvest. There are so many, Vanny, that you couldn't even. No, it'd be like going out and trying to count the, the grains of sand on the seashore. I mean, yes, there's, from, for our, from our standpoint right now, the resources of space are infinite, virtually so. Now, you know, a million years from now, maybe it's going to be a different story, but certainly from where we're at right now, um, I think the most viable option, and I agree here with Scott, is plan A, you know, let's, Let's evolve quickly over the next couple of decades to get to the point where we can create an invulnerability to planet Earth. Every time I see these ancient um, paintings of, of Michael slaying the dragon or St. George slaying the dragon, um, you always see, you know, the fair maiden in the background that's being protected by, well, you know, the dragons have always been a symbol to represent comets and asteroids and fireballs, right? The dragons. Think about a dragon. You know, it has a terrestrial existence and a, it can fly up to the sky. And, uh, you know, again, if we had graphic capabilities here, I could pull up a bunch of very interesting graphics to show you, you know, um, dragons in the sky literally being the way to that ancient peoples depicted uh, you know, seeing fireballs and meteorites and, and things like that, incursions of things in, you know, comets particularly, uh, oftentimes were displayed or represented as serpents. Um, so my point being is that there's kind of this encoded level of our own unconscious that we've carried forward these myths about saving the fair maiden from the ferocious dragon, which is essentially, you know, humankind saving the earth from the cosmic dragons. How's that? for a story for you, Vinny. <laughs> well, the other element is, like, I think the nature of uh, planet Earth and life cycles is that, as, as you say, it's a cycle, and uh, I've got a saying that in the end, everything comes back to the beginning, and we've it's, it's all been seen before, and there's bound to be methodologies for it um, to, to deal with it and what have you. Now, apparently, speaking of dragons... There's this dude who uh, wrote a book or, or, or made a film, or maybe both actually, uh, where he goes around and he looks for evidence of real, actual dragons with the fire breathing and all of this kind of stuff. And it turns out that in a lot of uh, old writings, even, um, say, Alexander the Great, 
there's uh, many chronicles of uh, men coming up against these strange giant lizard creatures. I think Alexander the Great even encountered one that he called an elephant eater. And, and I was just thinking, you know, how much myth is there actually out there that's based on fact? And, and, and to, to what extent? You know, were there actually gods walking around way back in the day with eagle heads and stuff like that, like the uh, like the Egyptian Horus uh, depicts? I'll let you take that one, Scott. Well, um, I wonder, you know, like um, the philosopher Rudolf Steiner talks about how in the past um, people were more open to the spiritual realities, almost like their pi their pineal glands were more open, if you will, and they could see the gods and sort of be in that astral realm more. And over time that became progressively hardened down so that we, lost, we sort of slowly lost that ability to see the gods and then that's when the gods became myths and, and, and stories and then later we didn't even believe in them um, but it doesn't mean that they're not there we just have lost our access to that realm perhaps where all of these mythological stories of dragons come from it, that, that's one take on it mm. another <clears throat> is that, that there really were dragons around that have died off but if that was the case one would expect to find some kind of physical remains or fossils or something that would indicate their existence um, so the the Steiner explanation sort of makes m the most sense to me that that there was a time when people um, were able to be more um, in tune with these non-physical beings and we just sort of ha that site has been occluded and and now lost. Well, yeah, you know, I, I do I do agree with that with that assessment. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Yeah, and then a, for for a more mundane uh, take on it, it's I've often thought it's highly probable that you know ancient peoples would occasionally dig up fossils of large, you know, particularly of dinosaurs and ancient creatures and so forth that, um, you know, could certainly be interpreted as, I mean, you know, you dig up a fossil and obviously if there's some kind of a real creature associated with that. Um, you know, when um, Lewis and Clark were heading out uh, on their expedition, uh, Thomas Jefferson sent uh, secret, uh, a, a, a secret letter via, um, oh, I forget exactly who, but... Uh, he sent them a secret message saying that they were supposed to search for the American incognitum, which was the, the name for this creature whose large bones had been found on the tributaries to the Ohio River. No one really knew what it was. It turned out later to be a mastodon. But, um, you know, people believed at the time they found those bones, they believed actually that the creature still existed. Um, and when they examined the, the jaw bones of mastodons, which were browsers, they, they ate tree branches. And so their, their jaw bones, their, their molars, looked very uh, formidable. And so people concluded from that that they were, um, that they were carnivorous and, and believed that they probably still existed in the Western wilderness. And the secret instructions to Lewis and Clark was that if they encountered one, if at all possible, please capture it and bring it back to Washington. I think Jefferson wanted to display it in the White House or perhaps have it penned up in the out in the backyard, but obviously they're extinct now. So, um, But I think that throughout history, people have long before scientists were digging up, paleontologists were digging up fossilized remains, I think people were finding them and, and you know, conjuring up stories to try to explain what they were finding. Sometimes there are and, surprises like, like the coelacanth, you know, where there's a creature that has long been thought to be extinct, and then suddenly someone finds a specimen of it. Right. And that can well, you know, I'm always intrigued by, you know, stories, cryptozoology, which is, you know, this large hominids, eight-foot hominids walking around in the woods and Loch Ness-type monsters. Um, you know, here in North America, there's about four or five lakes that each have a Loch Ness monster in it. Um, well. Uh, Scott, you're out there in British Columbia, you know, it's Lake Okanagan. 
Yeah. You ever been over there? And yeah, the there's there's a few monsters in there, you know. Um, I, I haven't seen one, but. Oh. I was hoping you'd say, yeah, you'd seen one. You're gonna. <laughs> well, you know, they have a they have a sculpted Ogopogo out there in the in the city square there somewhere. I don't know if you have you ever been over to. Um, Did you say Ogopogo? Ogopogo. Do you yeah, find an Ogopogo, Ogopogo in an in an archipelago? Uh, very possibly. I think that the Ogopogo is obviously an Indian term, and I don't know what it translates as. Maybe but, something uh, that bounces up and down. A creature that bounces up and down, like a pogo stick. Uh, oh, that must be it. So our pogo stick, what, that was originally what, an, an American Indian toy? Yeah, I don't know. Was, oh. As far as I know, it was, uh, when was the earliest time I ever saw a pogo stick? I think maybe in the 80s. Uh, did they still exist in the 80s? We oh. had them in the 50s and 60s, but... But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of lakes. Flathead Lake in western Montana has a monster. Uh, Pend Oreille in northern Idaho has had monster sightings. Lake Champlain uh, in upstate New York has had monster sightings. And what's interesting is they all have the same genesis as Loch Ness. They were also all glacially sculpted valleys that had huge subglacial floods uh, passing through them at the end of the Ice Age. So I've often wondered, every single lake, that's ever that I've ever heard a, a, a monster story associated with has had the same type of an origin, uh, basically born out of a out of a catastrophe, a catastrophic melting. Um, Loch Ness served as a huge conduit for uh, catastrophic meltwater flows of the melting Fennoscandian ice sheet around 13,000 years ago. So I don't know what that means. I have no idea, but I've noticed that all of the lakes that have you know, resident lake monsters all had the same type of origin. Mm. Well, there may be a truth to that, you know, that someone may discover someday the actual physical body of one of these creatures, and then we can we can mm -hmm. understand the, you know, Nessie in a new way. But until then, it's going to remain as these sightings and these this mystery. Right. Um, so, you know. Vinny, are there any monster stories from New Zealand? Um, coming out of the Parliament building, yeah, absolutely, lots of them. Yeah, I'm certainly, yeah, in, yes, I'm certain they're in, in... But, but, um, <laughs> in, in Māori, uh, mythology, there are, uh, creatures known as, uh, tanifa, which are, um, in some cases seen as monsters, other, other cases, uh, protected, and, um, it's a very real thing, and they're, there will be uh, stories of uh, Tanifa that will sabotage uh, bridge constructions and, thing, and, and things like that, or, or spirits and, and what have you. And a Māori elder will come in and uh, talk to the spirits, uh, bless the area, and in a construction zone where you would have uh, hammers falling from uh, great heights uh, and things being dropped all the time, things going missing, uh, uh, things breaking and, and what have you, and massive amounts of incidents of uh, injuries and, and, and the general workers being afraid, it, it just suddenly all stops and everything goes back to, to normal just perfectly. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of real things. Um, I, I think that's probably one of the... Uh, the elements of life that I find most intriguing is um, the bridge between the spirit world and uh, what really affects us here on the uh, on the so-called physical plane. Whether these stories are not just stories, where they actually mm -hmm. have a real physical effect. Yeah. Well, I, I tend to think I tend to think um, you know that the, that the stories can be interpreted on multiple levels. Um, Certainly, there's a spiritual level, but there's then there's a historical level. You know, when we look at the the flood stories, of course, you know, from my own research and what I've seen, you know, I, I believe that they're literally true on some level. Now, you know, they've taken the stories and kind of, I think, oversimplified them, um, and so they've become anathema to modern science. But if you look, you know, behind the stories, for example, of the floods, um, there's now overwhelmingly ge geological evidence that there have been gigantic floods that 
anybody lucky enough living in the vicinity or region of one of these floods, lucky enough to survive, could easily conclude that the whole world has just been destroyed. <clears throat> and I do know that Australia has um, very prolific flood myths. I'm not sure about New Zealand, but I wouldn't be surprised. Although I think the Maoris generally were latecomers to New Zealand, right? No more than well, about they, a thousand years ago. No, there is there is Maori um, uh, stories of a great flood as well. <clears throat> well, there we go. Again, a testament to the universality of that particular myth. And then the geol geological evidence supports the idea that, you know, there have been numerous gigantic floods, certainly um, tsunamis on a scale like we've not seen in modern times, you know, tsunamis that may be several hundred feet high or more, um, you know, the melting of the rapid melting of ice sheets that can cause catastrophic rises in sea level, you know, to any coastal community living at, you know, at the end of the last ice age, it could be quite devastating, you know, we in the, the concerns about global warming and, you know, talking about all the, the dire consequences of a two-foot sea level rise in the next century to well try to imagine what a 400-foot sea level rise would do to coastal communities. And most likely during the Ice Ages, one of the most habitable regions would have been, you know, along coastlines, um, along river valleys. And, of course, pretty much every river that you can look at um, – worldwide had had enormously augmented current flows at the end of the last ice age. I mean, sometimes orders of magnitude beyond their normal current carrying capacity, which basically means that, you know, any village, community, town, or, or uh, society of people living in those uh, river valleys essentially would have been washed away. Mm. Um, and, you know, this is why I've been saying for quite some time that I think that, you know, we're Marine archaeology is really a potential um, science that could reveal a whole lot about our, our past because recognizing, you know, that for long spans of time that we humans have been here, sea levels have been 350, 400, 450 feet lower than now, which exposes pretty much most of the continental shelves of the planet, right? And that's most likely where most of the people would have lived during the Ice Ages. So... You know, if you go back 14,000 years ago, we're in the Ice Age, and this is probably most of the habitable areas, the prime habitable real estate of the planet is now under hundreds of feet of ocean water. So, you know, when you, when you start taking all this into account, it becomes much easier to understand why we shouldn't see, you know, remnants of some vast infrastructure of some former civilization, because the skeptics who have dismissed the ideas of former advanced civilizations or at least um, fairly highly evolved uh, civilizations have not understood the sweep and scale of environmental changes that, that encompass this planet from time to time. And so, therefore, they don't, haven't appreciated the fact that there are these episodes that, that have happened repeatedly in the past that say they were to recur again would essentially render uh, our modern civilization, send it straight back to the Stone Age. And, and, and what uh, Scott was talking that. about earlier with the, um, um, you know, trying to recover, you know, the, the thing is, is that, you know, when, when you have a city lost like New Orleans during Katrina or New York uh, because of Hurricane Sandy, you know, you, it's a small part of a much larger intact infrastructure, which allows you to, you know, go in and rebuild. But, you know, if you're wiping out 10 or 100 major cities, or there's basically the loss of the entire infrastructure, you know, Scott was mentioning all of the, the various factors that went into, you know, creating a car or creating a computer. Well, you know, you have a computer sitting on your desk that's just a small object, but it took, you know, it took market forces operating all over the whole planet to bring that together. It took intact you know, an intact industrial base. It took intact functioning societies. So even if you had the knowledge or the know-how, um, it would be difficult to recreate a lot of what we have today because of the interdependence of our of our production networks. Um, and the incredible complexity of, of something like a modern computer. Yes. Is something that I, I would speculate that would never 
happen again without hundreds of years of, of work on it if, if we had to restart civilization. Yes. Uh, really, you know, you know, in the event of, you know, a, a social breakdown, if it wasn't just devastating to the point where, you know, we're talking about mass extinctions of species, because that's one threshold. If you're talking about mass extinction of species, at a much lower threshold, you could terminate civilization without necessarily exterminating species. Um, but really, you know, 19th, 18th, 19th century technologies, you know, that were limited in scope and, and largely self-sufficient on a community level would be the most viable way of trying to restart some kind of a, some kind of a culture, you know, um, getting back to the kinds of things that we did during the 1800s, 17 and 1800s, you know. And, um, and Randall, another uh, th uh, way of looking at this is um, I think that, uh, paleontologists say that the that we've been anatomically modern humans for something like two hundred thousand years. Does, does yes. that seem about right? Yes, I mean, maybe, I, maybe you know better. I, I think the well, I think what I've come across is that the now the oldest dated skeleton of a modern human is one hundred eighty about one hundred eighty thousand years, and there have been several that have been found in the range of one hundred fifty to one hundred eighty. So, so if you assume 150. that one hundred just to Pardon be conservative. Me? Let's just say yeah, it's 150,000 to be conservative. Yes. Well, that's a long time, and recorded history only goes back, let's say, 10,000 years. Well, what were we doing that other 140,000 years? Precisely. That's a long time. And I, I, would, I think we're in agreement that we probably had quite developed civilizations that were periodically interrupted by... Um, this cycle of catastrophe, uh, yes, with either flood or fire, mm -hmm. and we uh -huh. ought to learn from that and plan for it. And it seems like at one point we might just make it, and we're. It seems like this might be our chance to create that, um, you know, that barrier. Like I think it's the zona pellucida or the the membrane that protects the egg. You know, yeah. this is our chance to do that, and then we don't have to go back and start over again. You know, um, I think that we're close to it now. So, I think you know, we just have, as you were saying, in a hundred years' time, it's likely that we'll be mining asteroids, and if we're doing that sort of business, it seems logical that we would also push the uh, incoming comets out of the way so they don't hit the mm -hmm. Earth. But it's really just a question of whether we'll get there before, uh, you know, disaster strikes. Yeah, and I, I don't I, know. I'm an mean. optimist. I, th I think we will. Yeah, me too. I, I'm hopeful. Well, I'm hopeful too, but but I, I'm also um, I'm conscious that there's some people who really do want to see the world burn, and uh, kind of uh, are looking forward to li living underground and uh, coming out and owning everything. You you, yeah. you feel that kind of element, you know, that sort of yeah. self-destructive, suicidal, nihilist type scumbaggery? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I don't really hang out with those people much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I know they're out there. You're not a fan of, of being ritualistically like abused? You're not a fan of being ritualistically abused then? <laughs> no, I'm and ritualistically slain. Yeah, yeah. To prove some point, yeah. See, I think there are people perhaps who, who are so... Uh, misogynistic that they would rather see the whole world go to, to to hell so they can say, see, I was right. We humans are completely screwed up. Yeah, it's like the only reason we're screwed up is because you screwed us up, you scumbag. Yeah. <laughs> There's no responsibility. I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to hold up this and see if you can see it. Let's try this and see if it works. I can arrange it. Yeah. I can email them uh, a graphic too. Um, can you see this? Uh, yeah, a, a little bit. Can't can't quite make it out though. Can't quite make it out. Yeah, or like That's the my... uh, the words are a little bit fuzzy. But yeah, if you if you zoom into very particular parts of it, what what are we looking at there? Well, Cameron's actually says he's going to email it to you real quick. It's a uh, it's a graph I put together, uh, basically covering the last hundred and fifty thousand years, showing all of the so far documented catastrophic events that were they to happen today would seriously stress modern civilization, if not terminated altogether. 
And essentially, there's about uh, oh, about 12 or 13 entries in this graph so far of um, these extreme events that have occurred um, in the last 150,000 years. At least, so, so in other words, what I'm saying is that in the last 150,000 years, there's at least 12 events now documented that were they to recur again would seriously stress modern civilization. If not terminate it, probably affect it so drastically that it would take decades to recover from and would cost in the neighborhood of hundreds and hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars in terms of recovery costs. <laughs> so these are not things that see, see the problem is, is that for the last hundred or 200 years, we've had a relatively stable climate. And we've also had this dogma about earth history that says the way things are now is the way things always have been. It's called the uniformitarian doctrine. And it's a very potent way of interpreting past global change by saying, okay, let's look at things in the past, and then we'll look at things at the present, and we'll assume that if we see, you know, a river cutting a channel today, rivers cut channels the same way a million years ago. Or if we see mountains being eroded or mountains being uplifted or wind blowing sand across the desert, creating, you know, um, let, piles of sand that could eventually compress into sandstone. Looking at all of these processes today and extrapolating backwards, it's a very powerful tool for interpreting ancient earth change. However, in the 19th century, it became a dogma so that anybody who proposed anything catastrophic, if you will, um, was considered a crackpot. And so uh, basically the original models of earth change were all catastrophic. If you look at the, the founding fathers of geology, you know, um, Buckland and Cuvier and Sedgwick and Murchison and these guys, they were all catastrophists. They all believed that the, the earth had been subject to these great catastrophes. As the 19th century evolved, what you see happening is that the catastrophic interpretations are falling out of favor and being replaced with these gradualistic models. So that by the time we get to the 20th century, only gradualism is considered scientifically sound, and anything else is considered, you know, basically, you know, oh, you're, it's a throwback to biblical fundamentalism if you talk, start talking about deluges and big floods and so on. And everything, you see, once the, the age of the earth went from Bishop Usher's uh, length of, you know, 6,000 years or whatever it was to being hundreds of millions of years old, then it became possible to explain all change because you now have virtually infinite amount of time. So even though the change is occurring one grain of sand and one drop of water at a time, given enough time, we can raise mountains and we can erode mountains and so forth. Anyways, what I'm getting at here is uniformity became the dogma. And it totally dominated all thinking about geological change for three quarters of the 20th century. Only in the last quarter of the 20th century did we start acknowledging that catastrophes had actually happened. And, and, and it began to become incorporated into geological thinking, the framework of thinking about Earth history. That yes, there have been great floods, there have been great fires, there have been ice ages that have come in, you know, inconceivably fast and disappeared inconceivably fast. Sea level oscillating up and down 400 feet or more. Um, Asteroids strike the Earth, gigantic volcanic eruptions, you know, darkening the skies for years at a time. All of these things are becoming accepted now. But here's, here's something where it gets interesting, and I don't want to just dominate this, but I noticed that I took a series of geology courses in the early 90s. And at that point, you opened the geology textbooks, and there was discussion in there about the emergence of the new catastrophism. And you could see, like, a whole chapter, appendixes in there, appendices, talking about, you know, the role of asteroid impacts in mass extinctions, possibly in geomagnetism, in uh, uh, volcanism, it's uh, climate change. Well, I was, a few years ago, I was looking at a, a couple of recent geology texts that were basically 20 years more recent than from when I took geology courses in college. 
And I couldn't find anything in there about catastrophism. They had all essentially been replaced with global warming. So catastrophism was being written out of the geological text, and what was being, was being replaced with is an exclusive focus on anthropogenic or human-caused climate change, which to me was, is tragic in a way, because yes, humans are influencing the climate, but no, we're not the exclusive and only cause of climate change. The climate has been changing over and over again catastrophically since the Earth began, and it's not going to stop doing that based upon some new regulations passed by the EPA. I'm sorry. Uh, nor is it going to climate change going to stop if somehow we can artificially hold, um, you know, uh, CO2 emissions in the atmosphere to a concentration of 350 parts per million. And there's a lot of people out there now laboring under the delusion that if somehow we can get the, the, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere, which now stands at about 390 parts per million, back to 350 parts per million, the climate isn't going to change anymore. Well, that is dramatically and drastically mistaken. We will not stop the climate from changing. Yeah, I always thought about this. There was uh, some people out there talking about the post-carbon era. And I say the only thing that's going to be a post-carbon era is if carbon-based molecules, which includes you, aren't around anymore. And they go, oh, you don't believe in climate change. And I said, no, no, I believe in it. It's been happening for 4 billion years. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, see, the conversation has been hijacked. That's the problem, is that, you know, when, when the climate refused to obey the computer models, which are saying we should, it should be much hotter now than it really is, and when it, the climate leveled off for the last decade, um, then the, it, the, de -emphasis, the, the emphasis was taken off of global warming, and the term that was replaced was climate change. And I don't think you're going to find any scientist, ge geologist, or uh, climatologist, that, or any climate-related science that doesn't believe the climate is changing. And yet, what is happening now is anybody who questions the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change dogmas is now being called a climate change denier, which is which is sad because. There is no such thing, really, as a climate change denier. That's a fiction that's been concocted. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. Somebody, somebody called me that once, and I said, why are you calling me a climate denier? I never denied there was a climate. Yeah, and, and, and see, the thing is, this is not to say that you know we shouldn't be conscious of the influences that we're having on the climate. But it's also, you know, I mean, there's some bad science going on there. There, there's, of course, there's a core of truth to it. There, there is absolutely a core of truth. If we pump more CO2 into the atmosphere, it'll probably cause a gentle warming, right? Absolutely. I'm not seeing, I'm seeing that there are a lot more environmental issues that would take priority over that. Yeah, I mean, what's more dangerous to human existence? A massive Fukushima slash Chernobyl type nuclear disaster from a nuclear power plant that's built on a... a, a uh, a fault line, exactly. for example. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And and see, to me, it's this whole the whole climate change thing has become sort of a big distraction from a lot of other really important and critical issues that we're we're confronted with. Um, and that's not to say that it isn't an issue. Um, it is something that we should be concerned about, continue to learn about, continue to do computer model projections about. But you know, this demonizing of anybody who questions. These government authorized dogmas, that's not getting us anywhere. That's that's taking us backwards. Mm. Now, um, I'm also conscious of the time and that we're getting to uh, to the end of this uh, this hour here. And I'm also conscious that me and Randall are doing the bulk of the talking. Scott, do you have anything to add in about yeah, the I'm ready to thing? be quiet now. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm just enjoying the, you know, Randall's explanation here. And um, I agree that um, basically... If we reduce our CO2 emissions, that's a good thing, but it's missing the bigger issue, which is that the climate could be changed by orders of magnitude more by, let's say, cometary fragments hitting the Earth um, or some other upheaval, vol uh, massive volcanism that happens yes. somewhere. That could um, put more CO2 in the atmosphere than anything humans can ever do. Yes. So um, I think we... We ought to reduce our CO2, that, that we are anthropo 
anthropogenically adding to the atmosphere because that's all we can do. But we need to keep our our eyes open and not just pretend that if we do that, that all the problems are solved and we can forget all about the Earth, basically, uh, or our relationship with our solar system. Um, no, we, we have to become even more aware with this heightened rationality that we have. We need to use that to help protect our planet from destruction merely for our own survival, if for nothing else. Maybe it's a bit more difficult to control people if there's multiple things that they could be scared of instead of just the one big thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I guess it's easy to manipulate people with fear. Um, um, but again, I'm an optimist. I don't think these dire things are going to um, wipe out civilization. I think that we are creative enough to solve these challenges, but we need to take them seriously, and the only way we could get stung by them is by pretending that they don't. these problems don't exist mm. and putting our head in the sand and just saying, believing in uniformitarianism, for example, or believing that um, reducing anthropogenic um, carbon is the only thing we need to do um, would be another way to sort of ensure our destruction in, in the longer term. Yeah, right? well, the, the world's a very holistic place, you know, there's, there's so many things that are going on on the planet, you know, there's there's water, there's fire, there's air, there's earth, and uh, in everything in between, it's all being uh, affected and running in these very complex systems that are difficult to understand. But people lo don't like complex systems, because it means they have to think, it means they have to listen, it means they have to learn, and that can be very difficult for, for a lot of uh, people. So it's much easier to just say, hey, no, nah, there's only one issue that matters, and it's the most important, therefore the only one that should ever be paid any frickin' media attention to. Well, you know, people are called to evolve, and not everyone has to respond to that, and they can continue to just focus on one issue, and that's their prerogative, frankly. But um, for those that are drawn forward into evolving, into being, you know, using more creativity to solve these more complex problems, um, I think it, it adds a great fullness to your life to appreciate larger pictures, and, large, and with larger pictures come some larger problems. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, that's just how reality is. But again, being an optimist, looking at the perfection of everything. I think about the odds of us living on this planet in this perfect relationship with the sun and the moon, such that the moon covers the sun disk during a, a solar eclipse just perfectly, um, gives me hope that everything in some way is perfect and guided along in some way that is beyond our understanding. It's, it's such a level of genius that, it, it, that we only get glimpses of it. And so, I, you know, I'm confident that, uh, that, you know, people will rise to these challenges and solve them. <clears throat> I'm with Scott on this. That's, I, I, I'm an optimist also, and I, I think we're, you know, it, it may, we may have to get kicked, kicked in the teeth a couple of times, you know, and I, and I sort of suspect that that's going to have to happen. But um, I think then when it does happen, we'll, the, the species will rally. And um, do what we got to do, because um, you know I've been I've been running a business for 35 years now, and I know that the vast majority of people that I've dealt with are morally upright, ethical, good people. And I know that there are bad people out there who lie and cheat and steal. But and I've had, I've dealt with a few of those, um, and they're out there. But my take is that the majority of people want to do the right thing. And if you give them the truth and you give them the facts of the matter, they will do the right thing. Uh, the problem is we've got a situation now where basically people are being fed lots of propaganda and half-truths, and a lot of people who just don't have the time or the inclination to invest in investigating and researching to try to get to the bottom of many of the claims just – you know, it, it's easier to sometimes just go along with what, you know, is expected of your particular social group. You know, if you're if you consider yourself a liberal, well, then you're probably going to believe that humans are 
you know, causing uh, catastrophic climate change by burning fossil fuel. If you're a conservative, you probably don't believe that, but you believe that there's a jihadist under every bed ready to attack us. But, Maybe, you know, you the fact is my, that uh, both of these issues, I think, have been exploited uh, uh, USB stick uh, with my audio to, to achieve short-term goals by groups of people that find that they can, um, that they maintain and extend their power by doing so. And so, it, you know, I, I would like to see people be trained in how to, to, to read and perceive propaganda when they're being, when it's being fed to them. Um, you know, wouldn't it be a great case of irony if public schooling were required to school children in spotting propaganda? Yeah, no, no, that, no, because <clears throat> in fact, I think it's just the opposite. Pu public schooling exists primarily to feed children a steady diet of propaganda from the time that they're able to think on their own until they're adults. And by the time they get to be adults, they, they have no means of, you know, differentiating anymore. I imagine it'd be quite funny though. Halfway through the uh, halfway through the lesson, the uh, students start accusing the teacher of being a propagandist. <laughs> well, I'm always right, in favour of turning. Get off on the topic of public education because I'm I'm not a keen advocate of public government-run education. I think that the sooner that we get governments out of it, the sooner, at least in America anyway, that children are going to start becoming educated again. That's why I have been an activist and involved in the homeschool movement for nearly 20 years. And what I have seen there, uh, by contrast, is, is remarkable. Uh, you know, we should do a whole show just on that at some point. You know, um, what happens when you actually start raising children who are, you know, emotionally and mentally healthy and intellectually curious, haven't had their, their, their love of learning stunted, um, confined in the these straitjacket of public education, which is basically a factory system. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just almost miraculous things that are coming out of the homeschooling movement here in, in America. Mm. And um, that has been what's really convinced me. I mean, I knew even from my own schooling days that something was you know, seriously wrong with the whole system. Um, but now having had a chance to, to, to see it, something by contrast, uh, and how much superior it is on and, and at the same time, so much more economical, um, you know, government run education just keeps getting more and more and more expensive. At the same time, the quality just continues to decline. I think and, that's intentional. Yeah, I think it probably is. It probably is. And I don't know what's going on down there in New Zealand with that. I have no clue at all. Well, same difference. I mean, uh, basically, we've got a nice, big, fat, expensive public schooling system here. And the government's saying, oh, you know what's going to be better? Instead of publicly funding schools and giving people the education or whatever, we're going to take people's taxes and fund privately run schools instead. Because they, they'll obviously do it so much better if the private companies have government funding. What the frack is the difference? Well, that's no, see, there is no difference. If, and that's my, my criticism of charter schools, too, is that they're basically still being run by the government. Um, I think that, you know, in America, just the, the, the federal education bureaucracy consumes nearly $80 billion per year. That's just on the federal level. I mean, we could triple that when we start talking state and local. I can't even imagine what could happen if that vast pool of resources was turned back to the private sector, back to families. Um, what I have seen with homes, what homeschooling families have done in terms of with, with extremely limited resources, but by pooling those resources and working together and hiring teachers who are accountable only to the students and the parents, essentially the, the bureaucracy is gone, right? It, it doesn't even exist anymore. And what you're seeing is that kids are coming out there's just a, a very interesting article that I read a few days ago about a family with 10 homeschooling kids, and they're going off like uh, to college at the age of 12. That's how much better prepared they are working on their own outside the system. They're going off to college at the age of 12, and um, I think the oldest one uh, is now a, a Rowan. What was the, the oldest girl in the in the homeschool family? She was 22, and she's now a, a, a degreed medical doctor at the age of 22. 
Whoa. And these are the kind of stories that are coming out of the homeschooling movement, but mainstream media is not reporting them. They constantly homeschool kids, constantly winning spelling bees, geography bees, math bees, way out of proportion to their numbers. Well, I think that speaks loud and clear about, you know, what needs to happen is it, that we need to get education out of the hands of the government bureaucrats. Well, yeah, I mean, you shouldn't allow the stupidest of us to uh, try to educate the rest of us, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, well, we've, we've come to the end of the, uh, the first hour here. Now, um, would you like to take a break and, and, and continue, or is it, is it enough for a day? Scott? Well, I would like to continue, but I, I probably do need to take care of some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I as well, I, I really enjoy uh, talking with you, both of you, but uh, I think it's it's probably time to uh, have dinner here as well. Yeah, indeed. All right, gentlemen, well, thank you very much uh, for your time, and uh, would you just rattle off your uh, your websites and plug your products or, or, or anything of that nature, because I'd, I'd hate for you to leave the uh, the show and, and, and giving us, like, uh, in Scott's case, three hours of your time uh, without perhaps a little bit of a plug to get some money. Okay, I'll go first, and then I'll let Scott. Um, website, sacredgeometryinternational.com. Um, and on there, you'll be able to find, uh, you know, our, our upgraded version of the DVD is coming out very soon. And it's got four hours of juicy stuff um, on there. And a lot of a lot of the things like the graphics that I would have liked to have shown here tonight are in there. It's really, it's heavy on the graphics and the imagery and so on. And um, uh, yeah, anything else? Uh, what one? Is this live? Is this yeah, this, well, it's being recorded. Oh, uh, no, that's fine. They can find us on Facebook. Yeah, so you can find us on Facebook. So, but Sacred Geometry International will have links and connections to everything that's that's maybe of interest to people. And okay, Scott, and, and um, my website is secretsinplainsight.com, and I have two films there, uh, Volume One and Volume Two. They're both available on DVD or by download. You can watch Volume One for free on YouTube is also linked on my site. I have an extensive blog, and I also have a book and ebook called Taking Measure, which is a reflection on the research and experience that I had uh, in creating Secrets in Plain Sight, the films, and it also goes into some greater depth that you won't find in the film. So again, secretsinplainsight.com is where you can find out everything I'm up to. So thanks again, Vinny. And, and I want to say, I read Scott's book, and it's extremely fascinating. And it really does, you, somebody who's interested in this hidden web or matrix of interconnectedness, that book really, in a very succinct fashion, really, really nails it. Very interesting book. Well, thank you very much, Randall. And, you know, I watched your, uh, your uh, DVD set on the uh, cosmic patterns and cycles of catastrophe. And I was really impressed by that. It's got okay. uh, incredible graphics, and, and the information is fantastic as well. Oh, wait till you see the new and improved version. Oh, great. Cameron and I have been putting a lot of hours in really getting that thing. It's got a few little mistakes in there, and we've just we've made it a lot tighter, included some new graphics. So you'll be getting a copy of that. And uh, also, we, we've got some online classes we're working on. Uh, in sacred geometry. So if anybody uh, goes to the website, they'll be able to find out more information about that too. Okay, so that is Randall Carlson and Scott Onstott. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this extended broadcast today. And I would also like to uh, remind people that everything that I do is 100% pretty much funded by the listenership. Your donations and your monthly donations in the form of subscriptions, whether you want to give a dollar a month or a hundred dollars a month, it basically pays for everything that we're doing here and uh, the platform uh, that we choose to, you know, give to people who have really interesting things to say, like my two very special guests. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening, and we'll see you again sometime. All right. So long, Scott. Bye, hey, Randall. <laughs> Uh, socket stones are still there so one can actually measure 
there's two different ways. Um, there's two different ways of determining the, the measure of the pyramid's base, and one corresponds to a uh, a degree of equatorial latitude, and the other just uh, corresponds to a degree of equatorial longitude. And at, at a scale of 43,200, which of course is one of the, the sacred numbers of the ancient canon of cosmological numbers, um, you know, the basis of the, the Vedic system of the Yugas, it's found in the Sumerian king lists. Um, it's also the number, you know, at, a, at the moment of equinox, <clears throat> because there are <clears throat> 86,400 seconds in a day, at the moment of equinox, there would then be 43,200 seconds of light, 43,200 seconds of darkness. And that 43,200 is the scaling ratio. In other words, if you enlarge the Great Pyramid 43,200 times, its height corresponds to the polar radius, and its square base would then be the same as the Earth's, uh, the circle of the Earth's equator. Because, as you well know, Scott, the Great Pyramid's geometry squares the circle. That's right. Yeah, we need to encode this knowledge again. You know, in a, in other ways, I think. Um, just to um, back do our backup plan for a global catastrophe, it would be yes. good to ha have a number of, of pyramids around the world that uh, encode this sort of knowledge to a, um, a geometric solid, and then. Uh, covers it over and then places up two pillars, one of marble and one of brass, uh, marble to withstand flood and, or no, marble to withstand fire and brass to withstand flood, and then inscribes on those pillars, you know, essentially the instructions that there exists this time capsule with this encoded information in it. Um, so, I mean, that, that's an intricate. Uh, part of the Masonic allegory, you know, this, the story of Enoch and the, and the nine-chambered time capsule that he builds. And then there's another yeah. version where, where uh, it's Lamech who builds, who builds the, the chamber. But it's essentially the same thing, that these were individuals who foresaw the impending catastrophe and then took measures exactly as you're talking about to preserve as much as possible. And, you know, like you said, the Great Pyramid, that's an interesting because you know, there's our legends that you can go to. These have been uh, recorded quite a bit by um, some of the earlier authors on the, on the pyramid, mostly from, from Islamic legends uh, from about the Middle Ages. But, um, you know, they may actually precede the accounts we have from people like Herodotus and others, but they described having traveled through Egypt and seeing the Great Pyramid before the casing stones were stripped off, which I think was what, 11th or 12th century, right in there after the, one of the, uh, there was an earthquake that flattened most of Cairo, and at the same right. time, it, it, yeah, and it, it, it apparently dislodged a couple of stones of the casing stones that no one had ever been able to successfully penetrate because of the incredibly tight joinery, but this earthquake apparently dislodged a couple of the stones, which then allowed them to get in with their, with their prize and their levers and and essentially stripped the entire, most, virtually all of the casing stones. In fact, the ones that are still there apparently were preserved because they were buried under the rubble of stripping off the rest of the casing stones. But the Islamic way. We don't, we don't have, a, you know, it happened so long ago, and we don't have better accounts of what the pyramid was like before that, because I've heard stories that the, the casing stones were actually covered in hieroglyphs. Yes, that's and exactly what I was about to, that, yes. That's what I, where I was going with this, that there are these stories and legends that the entire outside of the pyramid was covered with, with inscriptions and hieroglyphs and symbolism. And I'm thinking, my God, what, what was lost with that? I mean, if there's truth to it, then why not? I mean, if you've been to Egypt, you go through, you know, you go down the Nile and you look at these temples and it's mind boggling. The amount of information that is encoded into, the, into every column and every lintel and every wall space on the ceilings, every square inch of these temples is covered in hieroglyphics and, and symbolism. Why not the surface of the pyramid as well? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and it's too bad we missed out on all of that wisdom and we're just sort of you know, trying to piece it together. But it, it's amazing that they encoded so much uh, you know, 
in the geometry, in the slope angle, in the in the sockets. You know, it encodes the speed of light. It encodes the uh, the the distance of uh, one degree of latitude. It, you know, it encodes the size of the Earth and the polar radius. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a treasure house of knowledge, um, but it's just hard to read. It, it, it only like a it's not basically for the common person just to come in there and understand it all. It takes like a life lifetimes of study to unpack these these this information that, that's encoded in there. Yeah, just the fact alone of, of how it encodes geodetic information I found very compelling because. Uh, you know, in some of my presentations, I, I take people through a whole lesson in geodesy, and starting with the um, you know the measure of the Earth back in Napoleonic times, right down through um, satellite surveys of the Earth, and um, you know, in the development of the world grid system, um, and then <clears throat> after doing that, then we begin to look at the geometry of the pyramid, and. It, as you, I'm sure, I think we even talked about this, Scott, that it, that it is a perfect scale model of the Northern Hemisphere uh, on a scale of 43,200 to 1. That, um, yeah, and if you, um, again, graphically it's easier to see this, but, you know, the, there, there was a set of um, socket stones surrounding the Great Pyramid uh, that are no longer there, but the, the, the impressions... <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a special extended conversation uh, between myself, Randall Carson, and Scott on Stott. Now, um, would we? Would anybody like to just kick off? I guess from where we left off on the show. Well, uh, Randall, you were talking about um, how comets periodically hit the Earth, and we were discussing plan basically plan A and plan B. Plan yeah. A would be to um, develop some kind of protective shield. I don't know if it's missiles or lasers or something to deflect the comets before they hit the Earth. Mm -hmm. And Plan B would be to develop some type of um, permanent monument on the Earth that encodes all of our knowledge or the most important knowledge in order to re, uh, recreate a modern society, presumably with electricity and and machines and computers and so on so that if there was a major disaster we wouldn't have to start at the stone age again right well that is that kind of the, the the story behind the masonic allegory of um of uh enoch and you know foreseeing that the great flood was going to come and wipe out the earth and so he constructs an underground time capsule an underground chamber consisting of of nine concentric uh, chambers, and in the, the central one, he encodes all of the information, the 